we all know the world is generating data more than ever. Uh, so how do we make sense of this data? The traditional data warehouses were not designed to handle this explosive growth in data. So as we see the data volume to increase, the complexity to increase, and the number of use cases around the data to grow, enterprises need actionable insights. So what do we mean by actionable insights? As the cost of storage and data processing reduce, enterprises want to process, store, and analyze all the data sets, internal and external to their organization. The modern data warehouse also needs to reflect the current state of business. That means you need to act in real time. You need to make those decisions in real time. We don't need a data warehouse which takes like weeks or even months to you know, get the software installed or even the hardware provision. We also want the insights to be available to the business users in their hands so that enterprises move more towards you know, data-driven uh, decision making. And last but not the least, we need security and governance. So we basically want to have the data accessible to the right stakeholders, internal and external to the organizations. Now, this statement still holds true. However, as the demand for new data types, new use cases, and the complexity has come in over the period of few years, the data warehouse architecture needs to evolve to meet these demands in both distributed and centralized solutions. So if you look over the last two decades, basically, you know, enterprises started using data warehouse more from an operational reporting purposes. And then we had you know, self-service BI coming in. And over the past decade, there has been a huge shift towards data mining, AI, and ML. So as businesses inspire to be data-driven, this requires the data warehouse to support their machine learning and AI initiatives. So we all need the data warehouse of future, but what worries us? We need to remember that data warehousing is not a use case. Data warehousing is a solution that enables higher order use cases to make the businesses data driven. And these are some of the common challenges uh, which we see enterprises and businesses face you know, mal while managing their data warehouse or even grow their data warehouse. So it's time now to modernize your data warehouse with BigQuery if you haven't already. So basically, BigQuery is Google Cloud's enterprise data warehouse. Uh, it scales from gigabytes to petabytes. There are numerous features of BigQuery to call out, out of which you know, there are a few unique features which we have listed out there. With my experience working with all these large digital enterprises, we have seen them uh, see a lot of value with real-time analytics because BigQuery natively supports real-time analytics and you can basically stream your data all the way into BigQuery and make all those real-time business decisions. So the challenges which I just showed you in, in the slide before, BigQuery enables us to overcome those challenges by offering scalability, simplicity, security, and a TCO for all kinds of business, businesses, no matter small or large. In terms of architecture, which most of you might be familiar, it's fully managed and serverless. The storage and compute are decoupled so that they scale independently on demand. This basically offers immense flexibility and control for the enterprises, and you don't need high compute resources to keep running 24 by 7. And this is very different from the traditional node-based and MPP data warehouses. So if I have to summarize what BigQuery brings to the table, it gives you a modern data warehouse, and basically it's focused on these six key areas. With that, I would like to introduce Zaki from Gojek to share his experience and Gojek's experience building their data warehouses and using BigQuery. Thank you, Gaurav. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our session today. So 
I am Zaki and uh, I work as a data engineer at Gojek. And uh, here uh, I would like to share Gojek's experience in building our data warehouse while we also uh, do our internationalization effort. Okay. Uh, has anyone of you heard about Gojek before? You can raise your hand. Oh, wow, cool. Thank you. Okay. Um, so Gojek is a technology company uh, in Indonesia that aims to improve people's quality of life. And then uh, Gojek was started in 2010, actually not as a technology company, but as a call center for motorbike service, uh, motorbike uh, taxi service called Ojek. So the idea of having Ojek uh, taking passengers around, moving things around, is very powerful that uh, we in 2015 are able to launch our three first digital, uh, digital products uh, called GoRide, GoSend, and GoShop, all centered around moving people and uh, things around. And uh, people likes uh, our products a lot. Uh, so in 2016, we are able to expand our uh, products to many other kind of services like lifestyle, digital payment, and entertainment, and many others. So uh, those many products has empowered uh, people in Indonesia. So uh, their quality of life has improved, and then we are having very successful businesses. So that in 2018, uh, we began our international uh, expansion to countries in Southeast Asia. Okay, um, so we have so many products here. You can see we have GoRide, GoCar for uh, transport services. Uh, we have uh, GoSend and GoBox for logistic services. We have uh, lifestyle services like GoMassage, GoGlam, and we have also GoClean and many others. Uh, we have also GoPay for payment. So. By having that uh, many products uh, in a single application, people uh, likes to call us a super app company. And uh, all of those products are very nice because it, uh, they bring convenience to people while also empowering uh, the drivers, empowering the service providers uh, so they can get a uh, living. Okay, um, this is our global footprint. So we have expanded to four countries in Southeast Asia, uh, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, and uh, soon we also uh, expanding to other countries. So in uh, those countries, uh, we operating in uh, essentially 204 cities in Southeast Asia. And uh, uh, operating in those uh, cities, our application has to, has been downloaded more than 130 million uh, times. And we also empower more than 400,000 merchants and more than 2 million uh, drivers, uh, essentially uh, generating more than uh, 100 million bookings. Okay, so we move on to our data warehouse architecture. So this is our uh, data warehouse architecture using GCP. Uh, we can uh, see that we have many, uh, many Google products there. We use BigQuery for our data warehouse. We use cloud storage for our uh, data lake. And then uh, Dataproc, Kubernetes, Dataflow for our ELT uh, execution and also like Composer stack driver for uh, operations and monitoring. So uh, we already ha know that we, we have to offer so many uh, services in, uh, for so many kind of businesses, different businesses. So uh, our data warehouse has the requirement to fulfill all of the, uh, the different businesses has to support uh, a range of different kind of businesses. So uh, Google products has helped us in building our data warehouse. 
uh, we can fulfill all the requirements supporting many different teams, probably with different kind of setups in each team. Uh, in each team can have like Postgres cluster, MySQL cluster, and then they can have a user uh, tracking system using a third, part, third party platform. So uh, all the Google products has helped us uh, in, in building our data warehouse. And uh, data warehouse uh, has called us a multi-product data warehouse because we have to support that uh, many kind of products. Okay, uh, this is the current statistic of uh, our data warehouse in, in the end of Q1 of 2019. Uh, we can see here that our data volume is uh, increasing more than 30% in each month. And then uh, because of uh, many and many data has ingested to our data warehouse, Many people can uh, use the data for insights, for analytics, so they can generate more than uh, 13,000 dashboard. Uh, the dashboard supports uh, from high level like strategic uh, team uh, doing, um, uh, doing uh, more strategic decision making until uh, operation level solving uh, passengers of uh, our driver challenge, or driver case and problems. So uh, the most important uh, metric uh, of our data warehouse is this, the growing numbers of uh, BigQuery user. So uh, our uh, data warehouse using BigQuery and then uh, we can see that in the end of Q1 2019, uh, we have 2,100 uh, uh, active users of BigQuery. This is uh, it is the three times uh, more, three times the number of the users in uh, mid 2018. This is the period uh, we do our global expansion, and then uh, more and more people rely on data when making decision, and then. Uh, here comes the challenge. Actually, oh, when people wants to develop ETL jobs, when people wants to schedule uh, their their uh, analytics queries, people rely heavily on our BI engineer to do that. People rely uh, heavily on uh, our BI engineer to uh, create ELT jobs, and uh, the our. BI engineers' capacity is uh, uh, is limited, and uh, more and more requests coming beyond our uh, BI engineers' capacities. And then here comes the other challenge: while we are uh, undergoing uh, very fast growth, uh, we have to we have to move us and then do international expansion. Uh, so we have to keep up with uh, our growth while we also have to support with global expansion. Um, we have to expand our data warehouse to countries in Southeast Asia and then uh, we are very lucky because uh, the GCP products that uh, empowers us has helped us uh, in many ways to support with, uh, with our data warehouse. But yeah, improvement can be made. Improvement can always be made. Uh, while uh, we have operating uh, and can support uh, all of those uh, use cases, uh, we realize that our current setup is not the most efficient setup. Uh, we, can, uh, we, can, uh, we can do more and more things to improve our efficiencies. Okay, so uh, we come with several questions that uh, we ask to ourselves. How can we survive uh, the global expansion? Um, uh, several questions that uh, we essentially have to solve uh, in, in, in a short period of time. So the first question is, 
how can we uh, extend the data warehouse to countries in Southeast Asia and uh, set up some GCP projects faster and easier for those uh, for those uh, extension. And the second question is, how can we manage uh, user access? So uh, when we know that uh, number of our data warehouse is growing, the thing that will directly impact us is how to manage those user access. Uh, if we don't uh, manage uh, user access uh, better, we will we will have difficulties in managing all of those access. And then uh, the third question is, how can we make uh, the ALT, ELT job uh, development less dependent on our PI engineers? And how can we make the development friendlier? And then uh, uh, also, well, usually the one that uh, develops the ELT job is BI engineer. How can we uh, make the development friendlier to non-BI engineers like analysts, uh, like product managers, or even uh, operation team uh, wants to do some queries to solve uh, people's problem? And then the last question is, how can we maintain users' confidence to data? So. Uh, we don't want uh, users to always worry about oh, what is the quality of data. Uh, is this uh, data good to use now? Or what What the things that I need to check to ensure that the data uh, can be used by me? Okay, so uh, the first thing that we do uh, by, uh, by uh, setting up uh, the GCP project faster is uh, expressing the, all the configuration in infrastructure as code. So we want uh, our data warehouse to be extended to each country in Southeast Asia. Some of them will have uh, common configuration. Some of them will have specific configuration. And then uh, those configuration can include uh, data modeling layers expressed in GCS uh, GCS bucket and uh, BigQuery dataset and many other uh, configurations like the Composer instances, the Kubernetes for executing the ELT jobs. So how can we uh, set up the project faster? So uh, here uh, we are using Terraform. So one platform to uh, to uh, help us uh, expressing our configuration uh, as code. And then uh, the nice thing uh, about expressing the configuration using infrastructure as code is uh, we can uh, set up faster. And then uh, by having the setup faster, we can, that we can do experimenting with different kind of setup. So, uh, we want to experiment with uh, Vietnam, for example. We can do this data modeling. We can do this composer. We can do this uh, Kubernetes cluster is enough or not. So we can uh, just express all the configuration using Terraform plan and Terraform apply. And then uh, the projects are there. We can uh, experiment with it. And then if we are done and uh, we are not satisfied with the settings, we can uh, use Terraform dis uh, destroy to delete the projects. And we can uh, repeat with uh, other configuration. And then the other nice thing is all the core configuration is stated explicitly in one file or probably two file. So we can, sh uh, we can share the configuration and everybody can see it. So we can have the common understandings about how the how the settings of uh, our data warehouse and then the second part is how can we better manage our user access to data so uh, we built a tool called uh, data peer so data peer will assist us in build uh, in uh, help 
user on board with the data warehouse. So previously, uh, previously user uh, request access to us by using email or coming to our desk directly. Like uh, it's not scalable to do that way. Every time we have uh, we get emails to uh, to give uh, to give them access, and then every time we do some work, and then uh, some people just come and then hey, give me give me access to this data set. And then we have conversation, and then yeah, we lost the productivity. So uh, we built this uh, data peer. So people that need access uh, only uh, open data peer, and then uh, they can request access in that uh, in the data peer dashboard. And then in the data peer, people will also uh, see uh, this data set is uh, can be accessed by. Uh, this uh, Google Groups, and then they can uh, join uh, some Google Groups that has access to dataset. So we manage user access using uh, Google Groups, and then uh, we develop the tools using uh, Google uh, IAM API. The backend for our tool is uh, Google IAM API. Uh, the third thing uh, that help us very much uh, to boost our productivity in uh, developing ELT job is having uh, having a tools that uh, helps uh, helps people they can set their own uh, ELT ELT jobs so um, uh, we think that SQL is a very nice thing uh, we can express transformation in SQL because uh, SQL is simple, straightforward, and then it's very intuitive. So uh, we move from uh, code-centered code uh, code -centered transformation into SQL-based uh, transformation. So when people know SQL uh, by doing analysis, um, uh, we can teach them uh, SQL uh, easier than teach them how to code. So while they know, uh, while they know SQL, they can uh, set their 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 own ELT jobs by by using the tools. So people uh, that have the query only needs to uh, install our Optimus CLI tools and then submit the query SQL query and then. Just select what is the destination data set and table, and then, uh, and then uh, determine what is the what is the schedule for the job, and then the Optimus tools will take care of the rest. Everything uh, done automated, and then people will uh, will also knows uh, what is the 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 result of the execution. And then. Uh, the fourth thing that uh, we build is uh, data quality service. So uh, we have the problems uh, of uh, convincing people that uh, this data, this table is uh, good to use, and then we don't want to uh, we don't want them to always worry about data uh, quality of of the data. We don't want them to uh, be surprised uh, in so late time because their data uh, has completeness issues, has uniqueness issues. So uh, we built uh, an automated data quality service that helps people with uh, uh, with checking the data quality of the uh, yeah the quality of data. And uh, we implement the data quality uh, service. Uh, in uh, in Google Google products uh, like Kubernetes and then uh, Composer to schedule uh, to schedule the execution of uh, data quality profiling. So when people uh, finish with uh, finish with uh, creating the ELT jobs, they can uh, continue with creating uh, data quality specification. Like uh, for these uh, columns. 
uh, what is the threshold for completeness? What is the threshold for uniqueness? So they can uh, submit the, the, the data quality specification into, uh, into a repo. So the tools will get the data quality specification, compiles it, and then just run the data quality profiling based on the specification. And then the data quality, uh, data quality assessment is done immediately after, uh, after the execution of each uh, ETL job. So people will always know what is the quality of their data. And then people can get alert if uh, some columns is uh, not, uh, not complete enough or, or uh, some keys is not unique. And then, but still, uh, problem with data is still there. So what is problem with data actually? So we already know that, uh, yeah, data warehouse is data warehouse. And then if uh, data comes to us, how can we uh, create such a, such a single version of truth? How can we create uh, um, a table uh, authoritative table that single table can be used by many people for analytics, for reporting. So uh, people uh, don't have to compare one source of data to other source of data because, yeah, too many data source to be used. So uh, the other thing is, how can we make sure that also the single version is, of truth is rich in context? So. Uh, for example, in Gojek, uh, we have uh, we have booking data with many dimensions like pick up, uh, drop off, the duration, and uh, the event logs. So uh, the other problem is how can we structure and model the data? So uh, luckily, uh, BigQuery has uh, some nice features uh, that helps us uh, with such problem that uh, solve uh, our 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 problem with uh, uh, with those uh, features, and then um, here we have event that will uh, shows us uh, tells us how can we uh, how can we structure the data in our data warehouse using those features so we can get the best of BigQuery in. Uh, uh, in solving our problems, even this come. Good afternoon. It's always interesting doing like a session at 4 p.m. right before. Do you guys know the act who's coming on tonight? Who's attending the party later on tonight? Anyone know who the act is? Gwen Stefani, right? So I'm literally the gatekeeper between you and uh, you and Gwen Stefani, which is which is tough. She's a lot better of a singer than I am, uh, so I can promise you that. But I would I'd hazard a guess that I can help you out with data warehousing a little bit better than she can. So the problem of data is still there. If you mind switching back to the slides, I'll do the demo just a little bit later. So I've been at Google four years, and one of the problems I really really like tackling—I'm a technical curriculum developer—is taking BigQuery and the things that it can do that seem like magic, like including many different types of data, petabytes of records, millions of different events, all inside of one place, and making it accessible to everybody. I'm going to show you just a little bit of a snippet of some code that you can see. I'll provide you the code. This session is being recorded. Also, we're going to be doing a hands-on lab after this session. So if you really want to get into the granular details, you can follow me back to Moscone South. But where I started my career you know, 15 years ago teaching SQL, one of the biggest things that was taught to me, and I'm going to ask you for the, for the answer for it, is if you have data that's in four different places, you have events, you have orders, you have pickups or drop-offs. That's what we call no a normalized data structure. Raise your hand if you've worked with databases before, you've heard of normalization. Raise your hand if you've worked with BigQuery before as well. Awesome. Keep your hands raised if you've worked with arrays inside of BigQuery or JSON data. OK, cool. So I'll speed through this a little bit. So the constant struggle is, do we split our data across many different tables? Inside of SQL, what do you have to do as a BI analyst to bring all those back together? 
You gotta join them all back together, right? It's everyone's SQL 101, you absolutely hate that stuff. Or do you dump it all in one big table and you have data uh, issues, one fact in one place, not so much you can repeat them. So since you've worked with, or you've heard of arrays before, one of the really cool data types that's natively supported inside of BigQuery is the array. So you have object-oriented programmers that are like, uh, obviously, yeah, I want to do a, arrays for everything. And you have SQL developers saying, whoa, whoa, we're rows and columns based. Keep your arrays to yourself. BigQuery as a data warehouse, as a data platform, can support both. And we're going to walk through examples of what's really um, beneficial at storing your data in that repeated format. This is Gojek, Zaki, and Gaurav provided me with an awesome table. This is a bookings table. So Zaki mentioned you have lots of different information about Gojek bookings, like motorcycle uh, ride shares, that are all inside of one table now. All that different context from 15 different tables is all in one. So if you notice, it looks really strange if you've never seen arrays inside of Big, BigQuery before. So this is actually only four rows of data on this screenshot. Yeah, there's a 1,000 or so in totally in BigQuery. But what's interesting is that you see that there's a status field and a time field for arrays that look like there are four rows of data inside of that first one. That's an array of data. So if you're familiar with like arrays, it's the bracket. Essentially, BigQuery visually breaks that out for you. But technically, behind the scenes, it's still in those brackets. And it's going to get really interesting when you see the demo of how to work with that. Natively supports stats. That's one data type, and you'll see how we work with those in just a minute. The other data type that's interesting, if you're looking at the top and you're, and you're like, I'm familiar in SQL with an alias, like naming a field something else, what on earth is events dot something, pick up dot something, destination dot something? It almost looks like you've got six or four different tables all inside of one. The structure, and this is not specific to BigQuery, this is just generally part of SQL, it's supported in BigQuery, it's called a struct, it's short for structure. You combine both of them together, and you can have really wide tables. A struct is kind of like a pre-joined table inside of BigQuery. So you both get the width of having information on events, pickup, destination. I'm going to show you an example data set that has over 30 structs in it. That's the Google Analytics uh, schema. And you get the granularity of having one row technically represents one order like a rideshare pickup or something like that. But within one row, you can have extreme granularity at the array level, where there's many different ha things happening with one order. So your queries can get at the high level, count star from all orders. Sure, I got four orders. Or I could look deep into the array values there without having to worry about um, data stored in a, in, in a repeated fashion, like a like truly denormalized. All right, so a little bit of a practice for you, a question. I'm a technical developer. You're not going to leave here without a quiz, and we definitely have some cool uh, lab promotions for you as well. In a schema inside of BigQuery, if you've worked with BigQuery before, you've seen this before, yell out maybe one or a couple of the structs. How do you, how do you know whether it's a struct? You're looking for a data type of uh, record. Whenever you see record in somebody's schema, you're like, whoa, this person's using structs. Yell one out. Event, event's one. Give me another one. Pick up, cool, what else? If you leave this class with nothing else, understanding the schema and the fact that whoever's created that table that you've inherited is using semi-structured data, either like nested or repeated, especially when you, raise your hand if you work with JSON data before. I never know if it's JSON or JSON data. That's another argument for a different time. Uh, ingesting that in, you definitely get some nested and repeated values. You can actually nest values 15 layers deep, the computer can handle it. Mentally, a human, if you gave them 15, essentially, tabs in a data set, your BI analyst might get really mad. All right, so you're exactly right. These are essentially kind of like four other tables that are pre-joined into there. Pre-joined, you can think for a huge performance benefit, means that you actually can get a lot of uh, performance not having to run that join behind the scenes, which is cool. So MySQL, Postgres, Cloud SQL, that's transactional. That's 80% writes, 20% reads. BigQuery. Data warehouse, you're doing the majority, 80% reads instead of writes. It's better to have that data stored inside of one table. You're not doing performance uh, uh, hits on joins. All right, now look at the mode and then find me the array or arrays. You guys are fast. That's exactly right. The events have that double level of granularity. The rows of this table, yes, they are on the order level. When you look at Google Analytics, it's on this session level. But within each of those different rows, you can get at extreme granularity by nesting an array, which is great. But when you write SQL against an array, unless you're experienced with it, which you're going to see in the demo, it's really, really painful. 
So a quick recap before the demo. Anytime you see record, that immediately means a struct. Struct is not specific to BigQuery, but it's natively supported. Anytime you see repeated in the mode, that means it's an array. You don't have to have a struct to have an array, but if you have, uh, you can nest arrays within structs. For example, the events is a struct, as you see here. That doesn't mean it has to be. Like, there are other things in here that aren't repeated, like the pickup latitude and pickup longitude. Unless you're changing your motorcycle ride mid-trip, there's no need to have that be an array. So that's not an array. That's just a normal struct. But the first one, it's an event. There's many different things that could happen over the course of the order. Rider picked up, dropped off, charge reversed, that type of stuff. That's an array. All right, let's take a look at what this actually looks like inside of code. So we're inside of BigQuery. You all are familiar with BigQuery before. If you're not, petabyte scale data analytics platform where you can just throw arbitrary amounts of SQL against it. If you're going to take a screenshot of one slide, what I did for those people who uh, want to leave early and catch Gwen, Gwen Stefani, I want you to take a screenshot of this. These are all the free links that you should know about. This session has a Dory, which is essentially a question and answer. If we don't get to your question at the end, I want you to post that question on there. And then later on tonight or later on this week, if you have a complicated data question, you want to know a cool link to a lab, I want you to post that question there. And Gaurav, Zaki, and I will definitely answer it. Next thing, all the code that you learned here, I've spent the last year of my life building out interactive labs to get you from a blank canvas in BigQuery to building machine learning models, to building nested repeated data structures, performance optimizing your queries, and you can get them for free, which is pretty cool. So that's that, uh, free labs. If you want to hear more of my voice, uh, you can actually take the Coursera course and you get a month free TLDR. I don't want to spend too much time to advertising, but if you don't get what you want out of this session, you're welcome to self-study with the labs. Come back with me to Moscone Cells after this. We're going to be working through one of them. So inside of BigQuery, Zaki was kind enough, Zaki and the team at Gojek were kind enough to give us a table. Inside of BigQuery, a cool thing that you can do, and I'll provide this code to all of you, is if somebody gives you a table, a cool thing, if you've never seen this before, what on earth? You can actually select the entire, uh, I'm holding down the command key or the Windows key, and you can actually highlight all the data sets that are inside of a query. It's kind of cool. So inside of there, generally we advise against, don't let your BI analyst do select star from a table limit 10. BigQuery already stores a lot of that metadata in a preview. So I don't even need to write any SQL to see what the data is in there. So recap, you can click on a table name. You can look at the metadata. And this is exactly where I took the screenshot from for the slides. And you're going, whoa, it's one row, but it's three things. And now that you know that it's an array of different values for timestamps, you're like, OK, cool, that's not too bad. Now what I want to do is I want to just get all the orders and all the different statuses for those orders. So I'm querying this. And you can see how this is, might potentially blow up. And I'm going to query these. So what's that going to look like? Well, if you saw by the big red exclamation mark, what? So this is a huge takeaway for the next five minutes of this lecture, is anytime you see this error, uh, you can Google it. It'll probably take you a video to, the, to, to this session or the documentation. Don't be afraid. When, you, when you're, you're literally doing just what well, seems like a simple SQL query, but all that means is that this person right here is an array, and we need to essentially unpack that array back into rows and columns before we can operate on it. BigQuery will definitely take your array and ingest it, no problems. But before we do that, let's talk about how arrays work inside of BigQuery. If you're familiar with object-oriented programming, you're going to see arrays a lot. And if you're a data analyst, data engineer, you're definitely going to see them a lot in your data warehouse. An array is an ordered set of values. They must share a data type. So here's just an array of strings, no big deal. We just passed in a bunch of fruit and we stored it as an array. We're specifying an array here. And we got one row. We got four things in that row. Now we can also infer it. So I don't tell it, I don't tell it that this is a string value, but it automatically just knows that that's going to be an array. What are some cool things that you can do with an arrays? Once it's in an array format, you want to particularly say, hey, I want to find the second element in the array. Who can tell me who's brave enough to shout it out and have it be recorded on YouTube? That <laughs> which, uh, what, is it, what are we going to return here when I run this? I've got uh, raspberry, blackberry, strawberry, cherry, and I've got offset of two in there. Look on line 41 before you shout out. What do you think? Hands up if you think cherry. Hands up if you think raspberry. What about blackberry? Oh, you all are too smart. What about strawberry? All right, yeah, you definitely are uh, earning, your, earning your, your alcoholic beverages later. It is zero indexed. Yes, exactly. So if you didn't want to do offset, you could do ordinal. How about now? Yell it out. What are we going to return now? 
Yeah, that's precisely right. So you can do cool things with arrays. You can just look at one value, zoom in on just one particular value. But what about I want to do? I want to see, hey, how many um, things are in that array? I can do array length. There's a ton of array functions. I'm just showing you the tip of the iceberg of some of the, the most, uh, most common. Aggregations, you have four items in your cart. Now here's the issue. We saw different levels of granularity in the bookings. This is the same thing here. I can't run a where clause against a typical where clause, select star from where, against this item. There are two different levels of granularity, right? How do I work with arrays? Well, let's go back to the Gojek example. Taking a look at the preview, we're going to look at the payment method. One insight, always start with a good question, right? All data analysis begins with a good question. Cash, cash, cash. Is cash the most popular method for the orders? Well, we can write a sim very simple SQL query. We're just going to say count of orders by the payment method, group it by. We're not even touching the array values. And you get the answer back for there. So you're like, OK, cool. This is basic SQL. We can see as an insight. Most of the people in this demo t uh, table pay with cash. And then the second highest is uh, GoPay, the native app-based payment. Not a problem. We're not touching any array values. All right, well, I'm going to go back into the table, and there's a bunch of interesting status fields associated with an order. Driver canceled, created, driver found. If you're familiar with SQL, one of the easiest ways that you can get a distinct list of values is select distinct. So select distinct status. If someone comes along to you with this query, you might just look at it and go, that's absolutely going to run fine. Boom, you're going to get this error. Immediately, you're going to get angry. And don't worry about it, but I want you to train your mind. As soon as you see array, I want you to memorize this word, unnest. If you ever get an array and you need to unpack it, the fancy way that we decided to call it is unnest that array. So once we break that array apart, it's going to look like this. Normal SQL runs fine. You can see that there are, let's see, nine unique statuses. This doesn't give us too much context. Let's add an additional aggregated field. Let's just say, hey, let's do a count of the orders by each of the distinct statuses that were in there. Now a note. Let's do a pause here. So what you've done, event is normally stored like this. One, two, three, four, five. That's a normal array, nested. Unnested means we're going to break this apart. That's unnest. Now, one really devilish thing you can do in your code, and I don't recommend it, is essentially this, in my mind, conceptually, is very different. This, nested. This, unnested. Do me a huge favor. When you unnest your arrays, aka turn them from line 106 to the rest, don't give them the same alias. It's incredibly confusing. And one of the best ways you can help out your fellow programmers Unnested array, you can name it whatever you want. Just make it really obvious which one is which, because that's the one that you actually have as your alias when you're pulling it from there. And you can see that that works just fine. Let's see the total amount of status. If I'm going to rename it on the fly for a demo, I need to rename it in all places. So that's the note that I have there. Always rename it as something different. And this is fundamentally what's going on. Nested, unnested. Rows. This is all in one row. This is all in normal, regular rows and columns. And you can go crazy with SQL on it. So you can see the majority here, we just have the quick insight. Majority of orders have the status uh, driver found, and then created, picked up, completed, customer canceled. Link it to a dashboard if you want. You can actually explore directly in Data Studio. I'm not going to show you that right now, but you can link a table directly into Data Studio. All right. I do want to leave a little bit of time at the end. So one of the things you might be asking is when you get access to this code, hey, Evan, I don't have Goject.Booking table because it's a sample. But what you do have is you have the Google Analytics schema. And if you think two or three structs inside of a table is a lot, if you, and this is all in the BigQuery public data, there's over 130 BigQuery public data sets for you to play with. One of them, or if you have your own Google Analytics account, is this Google Analytics sample. Uh, any guesses on how many? You might have already seen the answer. How many structs are in the Google Analytics schema? How wide is this schema? Just throw out a number. One, two, three. Seven. Let's see. Let's see. Let's put it What word are we going to search? Oh, it's already cheated. What word are you going to search for for the, uh, for the type? 
in his search for record, there's 32 structs inside the Google Analytics schema. That's ex essentially 32 pieces of context, other tables that are jammed in there. That's because there's a lot of data that's collected for your visitors for your e-commerce website. And you can see you can even nest structs. Hits dot product dot is impression. Hits dot event info, event category. So you can get a really, really what's called denormalized or gigantic singular table for reporting insights. And that's exactly how Google Analytics is set up. And that's the data set that you can experiment with. You can actually, as I said before, you can go 15 deep. So if you wanted to fix this query, for example, page title is our array. What you would need to do is hits. You're unnesting that. Give it a different name. Don't name it the same thing. Don't confuse everybody. And then you'll be able to select from it, and you get some really cool data that's returned. So why are you, a lot of you might be wondering, I'm never going to come across nested repeated fields. I don't have any JSON data. Ha ha, you will soon, because if you're building a classification model inside a BigQuery, which now you can do with just two lines of code, create model, model type classification using logistic regression, a little bit outside the scope of this um, talk. But what you're going to get back and this is what the lab is going to be at 5 o'clock in Moscone South. You're going to get back something. BigQuery is going to say, hey, you remember that talk? Hopefully you didn't, hopefully you didn't sleep through it. It's going to give you back. For example, this problem is whether or not a visitor who visits your website is going to buy or not buy in a return visit. It could be whatever problem that you want. But for a classification model, each of those classes, yes, they will buy, no, they won't buy, is going to return back in an array. And it's going to give you a confidence 55%, I'm sure, 44%, I'm, I'm not sure. And again, what's the main huge, um, if you're working with arrays, as soon as you see that word array inside a BigQuery, what's that other word that starts with a U that you, you should immediately memorize? Unnest. That's exactly what we're going to do in the last piece here. And then we'll open it up for questions. So this is the example of the, uh, the final, final result where you can do cool things like tell, I want the machine learning model to tell me its highest predictions where they're going to come back. You have to break that array apart. And then you can do normal SQL and get, hey, I'm 80% sure this person is going to come back and buy it from our website. Now, if you want to know how to create models, uh, that's the next session at um, 5 in Moscone South. BigQuery ML is really, really cool. Or if you want to get additional practice on working with arrays, we did a full-day boot camp predicting uh, NCAA March Madness uh, for men's and women's, who's going to be the final teams that are going to make it. We created an entire lab on machine learning for that one. That's this quest. We have an entire lab on loading in and querying JSON data, essentially this demo, but in a two-hour, really comprehensive lab. And then this lab is going to be the one that would be running a little bit later uh, on tonight, or you can take these uh, at your leisure.